Hi, this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, and today we have a very special guest. It is Bullseye the Clown, and Bullseye has some great stories to tell. He's going to tell you a little about himself, what he does, and he has a very entertaining story to share with you. So, Bullseye, tell everybody about yourself and what you do. Well, hello. Thank you for, uh, as you mentioned, I'm Bullseye the Clown. I, I am a humanitarian clown, uh, which means basically I go around to uh, children's hospitals and uh, senior living communities. I go to orphanages um, and I entertain um, the people in those particular places. Uh, I never really thought I would become a clown at my age. <laughs> I'm, I'm into my 50s. And so I never thought I would enter the second half of my life as a clown. Uh, <laughs> uh, up to that point, uh, I had been a stand-up comic for 10 years. So I did stand-up comedy for 10 years. And then uh, that kind of, I, did, I didn't feel like a sense of like purpose or anything doing the stand-up comedy. So I stopped doing comedy for a while and just got like a regular day job. And then my father uh, passed away in 2018. And when my father passed away, um, he never traveled and he never left the state of Ohio much. And so I thought, you know what, I really wanted to do something to honor him. And years ago, I saw a movie called Patch Adams with Robin Williams. And uh, Patch Adams is actually a real doctor who believes that most people can be cured more through human connection, love, um, peace, tenderness, than through pumping them full of a bunch of medications. And right. so he travels the world and he goes into all the places that I mentioned, orphanages, children's hospitals, he goes into war zones. And so I kind of remembered that. Um, and when my father passed away, I got online. I saw Patch Adams had a trip coming up to Russia. Um, that was in 2018. And on a whim, I just thought, you know what? I'm going to sign up. I've never been a clown. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I thought I'm going to do it. So I signed up for a 14 day trip to to Russia. It was wow. seven days. It was seven days in Moscow, seven days in St. Petersburg. This was like clowning boot camp. It was like a crash course in clowning. I mean, oh, wow. he, he wanted us to dress as a clown from the time we left our house. So we had to go to the airport with our clown shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> and so it started right from the moment I left the house. So for 14 straight days, we um, were in these clown costumes and, and you know, as a kid, I was bullied a lot as a kid. And so I tended to retreat a lot. I didn't want people to see me. Um, and so it became the opposite when we were in Russia. Everywhere we went, we were noticed and people saw us. And it really was a lot. It was a really just a, a lot of stimulation for somebody who tried to live like their life in the shadows and uh, and, and not be seen a lot. So, <laughs> uh, so it was quite the experience. And I never really expected to clown again once I got home. I just thought, okay, this is going to be like a one and done kind of thing. And right. um, there were some very amazing interactions that I had when I was in Russia um, on this clown trip that I thought, you know what? No, there's something to that. I, I, I need to continue doing that when I get home. Right. I need, and I need to figure out a way to continue to do that. Um, I, I can go through a couple of these uh, interactions if you would like me to. Can sure. I tell you what happened? Um, so one of the things that happened, this was just a very simple one. This was probably the second or third day we were there. We were on a bus. Um, there were 35 clowns on a bus <laughs> and we were heading from our hotel uh, to an orphanage. And we came to a stop at a, a stoplight and there was a little bus station right outside the window. And there was a group of people there and there was an older lady holding a bag of groceries. And I could see that nobody was really paying any attention to her. And she was just standing there waiting, I guess, on her bus. And yeah. so I just started pecking on the window, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and she looked up and I can't imagine what she thought when she saw like 35 clowns. on. I the know bus. I'm trying to envision it myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she kind of like gave me like a weird look and I started to wave at her and she just was like looking at me. She kind of waved a little bit and I was like yeah. waved a little faster. And she started to wave a little bit faster. And then uh, all of a sudden, all the clowns on the bus saw what I was doing and they all turned and they all started waving at the woman. Oh, how funny. And, and so she was waving. And then as the light changed and the bus pulled away, um, the old woman sat down on a bench and she started to cry. Oh. Now, why she started to cry, I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe it was the first time somebody noticed her that day or that yeah. week because uh, she was standing at a bus stop with nobody paying attention to her. Uh, maybe if she was happy that she wasn't kidnapped by a clown, of, a bus of clowns, or, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, 
but it was just, it, it was, this was an interaction I had just for what, maybe 30 seconds to a minute while we were on a bus, I was pecking on a window. I wasn't even beside her. Um, and just seeing the power that clowning had just in that particular moment. Right. Um, and I, you know, I'm not sure what her story was or what happened beyond that, but, um, it was, it, it was a wonderful little moment for all of us. So. That's amazing. You know, when you say that, I just think to myself, there are so many people out there that don't get any attention from anybody mm -hmm. and they feel a lack of love or emptiness inside. And at that moment, you guys probably gave her that love and that attention that she's been looking for her entire life. And even though she didn't know you and she couldn't in interact with you, the fact that you noticed her and gave her a few moments of attention, you know, probably meant the world to her. Yeah. And, you know, and that's kind of what I do as as a clown now it's like whenever so from that day uh on for the rest of that trip everywhere we went that was my goal i tried to look around the room if we went into an orphanage and all the kids were rushing to us i looked around the room and i tried to find that kid who was sitting in the corner who wasn't interacting with us yeah. uh, and then that became my mission was to go over and to get that one child involved it's like you know i don't i don't care about all the other kids who are being entertained by all the other clowns my my focus then became who is not enjoying this and who is not participating. And I wanted yeah. to find them. And of course in Russia, it became very difficult because they all spoke Russian and I spoke yeah. English. So <laughs> you couldn't really go up and start carrying on a conversation because right. I didn't know uh, what they were saying. So, yeah. <laughs> so it, it became a little more difficult, but uh, I mean, I remember at the orphanage, I went over and there was a little girl sitting there. And so um, I sat down beside her and she gave me a dirty look and she, yeah. got up and, <laughs> and she moved to a different chair. And so I got up and I followed her and I sat in the chair beside her and she, <laughs> <laughs> and she gave me another dirty. And we did this all the way around the entire outside perimeter of the orphanage. And so finally I thought, okay, this is not working. I'm not reaching this little girl. So I reached into my bag and I pulled out a little bottle of bubbles and I started blowing bubbles. And then she became fascinated by seeing the bubbles and she came over and sat beside me and I, Aww. and I gave her a dirty look and I got up and I moved. <laughs> 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 and, then, and then I moved to another chair and then she came over, she sat beside me in another chair and we just kind of reworked ourselves all the way back. Oh, around that's so bench. funny. And then finally, when we got back to where we started, then I handed her the bottle and I let her blow the bubbles. And then that, that was the way I knew that I, I finally reached her. Yeah. Um, but it was just little things like that. And so I knew when I got home um, that there was just something that I needed to do when I got home that I, I had to figure out a way to continue um, finding those people who feel like they're, um, invisible, locked away. Um, and so that became my mission once I got home. Now, what made you focus on this mission specifically? Why did you want to be a human, a uh, human, uh, humanitarian? <laughs> I got my tongue got tied for a second. Humanitarian. Easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Um, you know, when I started going to the clown conventions and I saw that everybody was doing like birthday parties and they clowned in the uh, circus and they did all the, that never really appealed to me. Um, I guess I I wanted something, and I, that's one of the reasons I left stand up was because I wasn't feeling a connection with people. Right. I wasn't feeling like that I was that what I did mattered. Yeah. Um, and so I guess that was when I was in Russia and I was doing that type of clowning. I felt like what we did mattered, and and it made a bigger impact on um, the people. And I wasn't impacting like a stadium full of people. I was impacting like maybe one person at a time. Yeah. And um, and I just felt, you know what, as much as I wanted to be like this huge celebrity and this huge star, and I want to impact millions of people, yeah, um, yeah, I just found that, you know what, that that is not what apparently I was called to do. I was called to kind of minister to people one at a time. And if that's the way that I have to do it, that's the way that I did it. And And so when I came home, I thought, well, where can I go? Where do people get kind of locked away and forgotten about? And my, my first thought was, um, senior living communities and uh, yeah. Alzheimer's wards and things like that. And so I really started preparing programs to take into um, memory cares and assisted livings. I started off as a as a as an exercise program. I called it clown fitness and I would go in with balloons and I would work out with them um, and then sit and make balloons with them afterwards and talk to them. And uh, so it's just kind of morphed from one thing to another. And I still continue to do the clown tours. I actually just did a clown tour to Mexico City. Oh, how nice. Um, and I'm getting ready to go to Costa Rica in September. So, I mean, I still do the ones where we, we go out of the country, um, but I still wanted to do some stuff closer to home as well. 
Oh, that's wonderful. I like that a lot. Cause I think sometimes the gratification of just helping one individual is so meaningful. You know, it's a lot of people, you know, they go into something and they think about becoming a celebrity or they think about how much money they can make, but really, you know, Helping others, I think, is the greatest reward. The greatest feeling of self-gratification is, is to be able to help another human being and to know that you helped someone else or maybe changed their life forever or brought them that moment of happiness that actually changed their life. It is, is there's word, Words can't even describe it. You know, I, I feel like it's such a special feeling you must feel inside when you know that you've touched someone in a special way. You know, sometimes we don't know, um, you know, um, so I, you know, we don't really know what kind of an impact we have until maybe the moment has passed. So part of that is, but my mom, she came up to me, she said, well, why don't you just go into like one community and do like activities and do like programs for just like one community. So I did that. I actually did that for a couple of years. And, um, once I was there for two years, I felt like, you know, I, I knew all of the residents there and I felt like, okay, I did what I came to do. Um, mm -hmm. And so I decided to leave that community and move, move on. And all of the residents, one at a time just kept coming up to me and saying, Oh my God, don't go. You've changed my life. And, all, you know, and, and I mean, they, they were crying. I mean, I have, you know, like 80 year old men and, and women coming up to me and crying because I'm leaving and because I have made such an impact on them. And while I was making that impact, I had no, I had no clue. I thought, oh, we're just playing bingo, you know, you know, yeah. or, or, or we're just doing, you know, fitness class or, or whatever it happened to be. Um, but, you know, for a lot of them, it was like, you know, some of them who had no family, I became their family. I was their family member um, right. for, for the length of time that I was there. And so, yeah, so a lot of times we, we go through life and we make impacts on people. And sometimes we don't even know the people that we impacted, you right. know, um, and what kind of effect we've actually had on their life until maybe it's over or until we, we may never know. Um, right. There there may be some people out there that, you know, in Russia say that I might have impacted that I don't recall interacting with, but they might remember that. That one moment. Mm -hmm. Now, we before we started the show, you were talking about um, that you had been bullied as a child and that you even wrote a book. And you helped, you know, you, you started to help others. Now, can you tell us a little about that? I think it's such an important topic because so many people today get bullied and you hear stories about how young teens have committed suicide because of bullying or how it has, has really put a traumatic, you know, um, kind of a scar on, on, on children's lives or even adults, because, you know, when the, these bullies uh, bully when, at young age, they probably pick it up from their own anger that they have or from just seeing how the environment they grew up in. And they do these things and then they carry it through. And then they probably bully people as they get into adulthood and they probably hurt others. And the cycle keeps repeating itself, and repeating itself. But for the victim, you know, I think it's something we should talk about because, you know, um, you know, so many people are bullied and you don't want to see them get hurt to the extent where they commit suicide or it interferes with themselves where they have such a low self-esteem or then and they don't want to become anything because they don't feel worthy of it. So can you tell us a little about your own story and how you overcame it? Because I think that's so important. Yeah. Uh, so, well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we were talking about, you know, uh, impacting like throngs and throngs of people, you know, as a kid and growing up, you know, I used to watch a lot of, you know, um, entertainment shows on television. And I really wanted to be like a, a, an entertainer. I really, really yeah. wanted to be an actor. And I really wanted to um, become this, this famous person. And, mm -hmm. um, but then I was getting bullied at school. And so, um, that affected what I did. I mean, you know, I would not try out for certain parts because I thought, oh, I'm not going to get it. Or, um, I don't feel like I'm worthy to audition for that because, you know, the guy from the football team is going to be auditioning for this part. And you right. know, I don't want, you know, the last thing I want to do is take his part. If I, you know, get his part, I'll get beat up. Yeah. Um, and so, um, all through school, it was, you know, it was the being pushed into the lockers, being called names, the, um, that kind of thing. Luckily, luckily at that time, we didn't have the internet. Um, that yeah. was way before the internet. So um, now, you know, now we have, you know, Facebook and Twitter where people can bully you. But back then they just showed up on your front lawn and, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and ran your underwear up the flagpole, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, 
So I would get bullied at home and then at, or at school. And then at home, I actually, my parents divorced when I was really young. And so I grew up with my mom and an alcoholic stepfather who was abusive. Wow. And so I would not, I didn't even get this to relax at home. It was, it was always um, a chore at home even to, to function. So I would tend to lock myself in my room a lot and um, just watch TV or whatever. Uh, and that just kind of perpetuated. I mean, then I went into college um, and after college, it was kind of the, it, during college, it was kind of the same thing. I was, you know, I would get bullied by certain people at the college and um, I was a theater major. So that didn't really make you a, <laughs> a, a beacon of hope or whatever for anybody at school. Um, and I never really expressed, you know, um, anything to anyone. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my parents I was being bullied or anything like that. And so that was just something I carried all the way through, really, until um, until my father passed away in 2018. So from the time I was born in 71 and all the way through 2018, um, mm -hmm. that was just something I carried with me. I was like, I didn't want to be a poster child for bullied kids. I didn't want to, you know, be up on a platform talking about it. Yeah. Um, and then when I went to Russia and we started clowning and we, you know, we were happy, 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 happy for 14 straight days, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that, that was our goal was to make everybody smile and to be happy. If you yeah. have, if you have problems at home, you leave it at home and you're happy for 14 days. Well, when I came home, all of that anger and angst and stuff that I had about being bullied and all of, that was gone. Wow. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I try, I tried to get angry about it, you know, yeah. and it just, it, it just didn't happen. And I'm you thought, it. You know, yeah, I was like, there was just something about doing nice things for other people that healed what was other, what was wrong inside me. Right. And so it, it was at that time that I thought, you know what, now I think I'm ready to talk about that. And so that's when I started, I sat down and I started to write the book. I mean, it's a very small book and it was meant to be small. It's something that somebody can pick up, whether it's a child or whether it's an adult and just flip to a chapter and there's a chapter like on cyberbullying and how do you deal with a cyber bully? And it's right. just a really quick chapter on things you can do. Um, and, but I just really wanted to get a story out there and, and let people know that, yes, um, I was bullied. I lived through it. I didn't kill anyone, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, but then of course, you know, I went through that whole thing too. Like we were talking about earlier about unworthiness. I'm like, you know, well, who am I to write a book on bullying? I'm not a psychologist and I'm not a, you know, psychiatrist. And, right. um, but then the more I thought about it, I'm like, you know what? I lived through it. You know, yes. this is something that I lived through. I would much rather read a book from somebody who was bullied 100%. Than, somebody, than, than from a doctor or a psychologist who knows about it, but has never actually experienced it. And so that was kind of, um, that was another way that I was able to release it. I'm like, you know what? I do have the authority to talk about this because it actually happened to me. A hundred percent. And there are some things in the books that I, I know that some of the psychologists say that's very controversial and we don't really agree with that. And I'm like, that's great that because you didn't go through that. I did. This is the way that I coped with it and how I coped with it might not be the way that you would suggest someone cope with it, but it worked for me. Um, that's all I can say. You know, right. I, I can, you know, I can only give you what I did. Um, I'm not going to give you some fancy explanation of something that may or may not work. It's just something that worked for me um, through years and years of trial and error, you know? Yeah, definitely. Most speakers, when they come on stage, there's not, it's not because they are a doctor or someone knowledgeable in the field, you know, that are, you know, informational wise, there are people who actually experience what they're talking about. Right. And they use their own experiences to do the, these speaking events. And, you know, I think, I think going through it and living through it and being able to give you know, tips, I think is more valuable. And I think people, society respects that more because they're like, wow, this person's been through it. They know what's going on, you know, rather than someone that's just, you know, looked at the statistics or looked through the journals, you know, and they're going by, you know, studies, you know, because right. you don't, you know, you don't really know until you live through it. Absolutely. And so that's kind of, and so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and write the book. I <laughs> get the book out there and, uh, and start talking about it, you know, um, going into schools and, and talking to children about being bullied. And I think that's um, great. And ideally, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I, when I started working about the, writing the book and, and talking about bullying, I never really had children in mind. Mm -hmm. I had adults in mind who adults who were bullied and never got over it, 
Yeah. They never, it never became what they wanted to become when they were younger. Yeah. Because I, because I felt that like that was me. I was like, you know, I wanted to be this actor and it never really happened. And it never really happened because of the way I was treated when I was younger. And I didn't feel that I was worthy to go to auditions or um, that I, that I should be able to, to be an actor because, you know, I'm not the good looking thin, you know, that kind of, I mean, all those things play, you know, all those things play in your head. Yeah. You know, even though I know Danny DeVito is an actor and he's not thin or cute or whatever. <laughs> 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 so, uh, uh, but you know, so you know, and you you take advice from people, and, and that's the that's one of the things that it is is I was taking advice from a drunk, <laughs> abusive alcoholic, you know, right, who couldn't hold a job, and and this is the per this is the standard of the person that I'm, I'm basing the rest of my life on is is hearing what he has to say and taking what he says to heart, so you really have to kind of stand back and say, like, who am I taking this advice from? Right. Um, and and what are they doing with their life? And, and you know, it, what's really interesting is a lot of the kids who bullied me in school, um, they're still back in the same old hometown and they're still, you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Flipping burgers at McDonald's and they're, or, or, you know, I'm just working like little mundane jobs there too. So I'm kind of like, you know, all this, all this years and years and years that I could have been doing other things. I was stunted by that because I listened to what these people had to say. And this is, this is the advice of the people that I was taking it from. So, you know, <laughs> but that so, usually, uh, so usually happens, you know, most of these people are, come from dysfunctional homes and then they have a lot of anger. And so they take their anger out on others, you know, and they take their anger out on others that they know won't fight back, you know, right. and that's mm -hmm. the thing. They look for people, they look for targets and they look for a specific type of targets because not everybody wants to fight back, even though if they're right. able to, they don't want to, you know, and they don't. And, and those are the type of people they look for, you know, they, they yep. stigmatize them and, and they look yep. for those certain types of people. And that's exactly what I, I I have a whole chapter in, you know, why, why are they targeting me? Um, so I actually have a whole chapter on uh, things that bullies are looking for and, and why they target certain people. And so like, even in my, uh, boot, I call my bully proof boot camps. Even when I do like a boot camp at a school, you know, I'll have, I'll find some like the meeker little kids and I'll have them come up and I'll, and I'll have them try to act like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or, you know, Clint Eastwood. And yeah, they feel silly doing it, but they see that, you know, body language does matter. You know, how, how you carry yourself while you're at school. Um, if you're always looking down at your phone or your, your, yeah. your, nose, your nose is in a book, um, you become a target. So, you yeah. know, make, making sure that, you know, you hold your head up and you're, and you're really scanning around and paying attention to what's around you so that if something's going to happen, you can see it coming, you know? Right. Um, so those are just like the little things that, that I talk about, you know? Um, and like I said, I, I wish I had known all of this stuff back whenever I was growing up, because maybe my whole life would have gone a different direction. Maybe I would never have been a clown. I don't know. Um, I think you know, we so all say that though, you know, yeah. like if we, if we could actually know what we knew 10, 20, 30 <sighs> years ago, you know, life would be so different, but that's, you know, you hear that, that phrase come out of everybody's mind. If right. I only knew, if I only had this knowledge, you know, you know, 20, 30 years ago when I was young, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's a common thing, you know, we, we grow as, as we get older and, and we become more knowledgeable, but it's a learning process. And we learn, is, from, yeah. you know, we learn from our, our, our experiences and we grow stronger from them as well. So then that became my, that became another mission is like, if, if I can just change one kid's tra trajectory, you know, if, if from the time he's in, you know, say grade school, if I can, and he's being bullied, if I can get him to not be bullied by the time he enters high school and then he can live the rest of his life, you know, if he can learn that at a quicker age than what I did at like 50, <laughs> you what know, what tips would you give them? Like if you had, if you were, if you had a group of kids that were getting bullied in front of you right now, what would you tell them? What tips would you, would you give them to help them? Uh, one of the tips that I always, one of the things I did is I, I remapped where I was going. So if, if there was a certain particular place that I was always getting bullied, say if it was at my locker after third period, um, then I began to not be at my locker at the end of third period. I would take that extra book with me um, and then I, I would find a different way to, to go. So I would either go to my locker at a different time or I would take a different path to get where I was going. That would That's one thing that I would do is I would just kind of remap my day so right. that I wasn't always in the path of the bully. Um, and probably one of the reasons I ended up becoming a clown now that I think about it <laughs> is, uh, one of the things I would always do is I would create distractions. So like if a, a bully was coming to bully me, I would scream fire, 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 or I would lay down, <laughs> or I, or I would lay down on the floor and I would scream, oh, 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> they had no idea what I was doing. So um, they were like, oh, don't mess with that kid. He's nuts, you know? <laughs> That's so um, funny. Uh, so I would create some kind of a distraction, whatever it happened to be, um, you know, or sometimes I would just like throw like a, a joke out and then they would be, while they're thinking about the punchline of the joke, I'm gone, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so it, little things like that, you know, it's just kind of, um, and always being able to stand up for yourself. You know, I, I would always at least shout, you know, like, no. And, um, you know, you have no power over me. <laughs> right. were like this big football player, <laughs> um, but, but, you know, the, the louder you are, like when there's people around, they know that it's going to attract attention. So they kind of back off. Right. Um, and if you have friends, I, I always say it's, it's better to travel in a pack. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you have like a, just a couple buddies, you know, always you know, maybe and if one of your, if they're singling you out and bullying you when you're alone, then try to travel in a pack and, and try to be in a pack of a group of people because they're less likely to, to target you if they see that they're having to take on two or three kids at the same time. Right. Right. So just little things like that. I mean, there, there are a lot of little, little things that you can do. Uh, and then, like I said, you know, as far as, and right, right now, a big one is cyberbullying. Um, yeah. So there are certain, you know, there are certain uh, platforms that I just refuse to go on. Uh, yeah. Twitter is Twitter is one of them. I think Twitter is probably if you don't 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 tell Elon Musk I'm saying this, but <laughs> 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 I don't want his wrath coming down on me. Uh -oh. But I find that Twitter is probably the worst as far as bullying um, because anybody can just follow, you know follow you on Twitter. You know, with like Facebook, Facebook you can approve them. And right. You can also, and you can block them easier. Yeah. Um, and like I said, every time that uh, I always tell people, you know, you, you don't need to be friends with everybody in the world, you know, mm -hmm. pick, pick your group that you want to be friends with. Yes. Um, the first thing I, the first thing I do is if somebody, even, even now it's, you know, um, I only have like maybe a thousand friends on Facebook, which, you know, some mm -hmm. people are at their 5,000 limit or whatever. Um, I delete a lot of, I delete a lot of people. A lot of people want to be my friend. And the first thing I do is I go to their Facebook page and I start scrolling and I, and I scroll for maybe 10 or 12 pages. I'll, I'll just keep on going. I, I want to see what kind of stuff they're posting. And if they're posting right. a lot of stuff, um, talking bad about people, or I see just a lot of negative stuff on their feed, um, I reject them. I, I say, that's not something that I, that I want to deal with, you know, right. um, I want to surround myself with, you know, happy, positive people. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, people that I would actually want to be friends with. So, you know, and I can tell right away by looking at somebody's page, what they're, what they're posting. And so, um, I, so I think you have more control over like Facebook and Instagram. Those are a little easier to control right. um, than Twitter. So that's, that's always my suggestion is, you know, just double check, you know, the people that want to be your friend first Yes. Um, and then get friendly with your delete button. Cause mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I delete a lot of people, you know, I'll delete and block if I have to, you know, people keep, you know, trying to be my friend and, you know, and all they're wanting to do is post bad stuff. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's a great, you know, that's a great suggestion. And also I, I think too, you know, like, I had uh, spoken with this person and I was this person, you know, they had so much potential, but they weren't using it. And I said, why don't you do X, Y, and Z? I said, you have, you know, you have this going for you. You have that going for you. And she had an alcoholic father and she had mother with men mental illness. And I think it really affected her growing up. And she said to me, you know, sometimes when people say things, you start to believe it after so long. Oh yeah, and, absolutely. And I think absolutely. That, it made me really think, you know, and I think that, that, that people don't realize how harmful words could be if, you know, we, we have to really be careful what we say to others because it really could hurt others for the rest of their lives. I think it is. And, and like I said, and that's, you know, that's exactly why I never, I, I, at one time I wanted to move to New York or I wanted to move to Los Angeles to pursue uh, acting. And I never did. I was like, you know what, I'll be alive in those places. Cause that's what everybody told me, you know, you'll never yeah. make it there. Uh, that's only for, you know, the really, really talented, the really, you know, buff, sexy, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, you know, and yeah. they're like, look at some of these actors, they can't act worth a darn, but they're cute. So they get the parts, you know, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was all that kind of stuff. And so I, I was like, you know what? Yeah. I don't, I don't want to subject myself to all that. And so I just listened to what everybody said and, um, and I kind of retreated, you know, and I found it interesting that, you know, you have certain people who were bullied as a kid mm -hmm. who are, who kind of took the path that I did in a way, which was, you know, um, you take this path where you don't really do what it is you, you really, really wanted to do. And so you just right. kind of, 
you just kind of stumble along until you and kind of stumble into things. And then you have the people who are bullied who become these huge mega superstars, you know, like Susan Boyle and um, right. Lady, Lady Gaga and people like that who sort of say, you know, who they're like, you know, heck with you and, and at all costs, I'm going to be somebody um, yeah. because you said I couldn't do it. So I always found it interesting that there's always those two dynamics. And so originally yeah. when I was talking about bullying, it's like I wanted to reach that dynamic of the people who um, were kind of like me. They were just like kind of like, you know what? I wanted to be a lawyer and I never went to law school because I didn't think I was smart enough. So now I'm working as a manager at McDonald's. Right. You know? uh, and so those were originally the kind of people that I wanted to to target and and, and really um, talk to and try to get them over that that mental hurdle that they have um, about their earlier life and being bullied. I And I, I think you've accomplished it. You know, I, I really do. I think, you know, um, you didn't plan to do it this way, but it all turned out, <laughs> no. it, you know, and, and I, I think it worked out great though. I think, you know, you really, you hit that dynamic point, you know, in your life, I think, you know. I tried, like I said, I, I never thought at uh, <laughs> 52, I would be like a clown, uh, and wearing, you know, big bloomers and a red nose. <laughs> <and everything. laughs> well, most people actually make their big career changes around our age, you know, yeah. that's, yeah. you know. Most people realize, you know, that, hey, you know, I want to do this. And they just start to take a different direction in life. And, you know, it's it's more common than you actually think. You know, a lot of people do that. Yeah, because, you know, I, I always thought, oh, by the time I'm, you know, 45, my career will be, I'll be on this career tra trajectory. I'll be, I'll be where I need to be. I'll be, you know, making the kind of money that I want to make and, 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 at 50, I'm like, okay, this is not what I had envisioned at all. <laughs> <laughs> I think if like, you, have, you have belief in yourself, anything could be possible. That's true. That's that's very true. Yep. And, and that's, you know, and that up to this point, that was what I did not have, you know. Um, it was just kind of like I went where the wind blew me, you know, kind of like, right. oh, okay, I, here I am now. Okay, I'll, I'll work here for a little while, you know, right. and do this for a little while. That's, you know, so tell me about your website. What's on your website? Where can people find you? I'm um, actually, I have uh, two websites now. Okay. Uh, my first website, my, my main one is uh, bullseyetheclown.com. Um, and that's where, you know, um, you can also find like links to Facebook. I'm also on Facebook and I'm also on Instagram. I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you see Bullseye the Clown on Twitter, that's not me. Um, <laughs> I, I don't do Twitter. Um, and then my other one, I have actually just started a business called Clowns on a Mission. Like and that. so um, the whole point of Clowns on a Mission is what I mentioned earlier is um, we we try to raise money so that we can actually take the, the tours to go into um, children's hospitals and orphanages and um, go into different countries, into war zones, wherever we need to go, um, where people need uh, laughter. Yeah. And so a lot of. A lot of these trips, you know, all of, actually all of these trips are self-funded. We we don't get paid to go on them. Right. Um, we we have to pay to go. Um, and so it basically, I decided to set up an organization called Clowns on a Mission, where we raise money um, that will allow the clowns then to to go where they're needed. Oh, I think that's great. I think that's great. You know, seventy percent of illness is caused by stress. Mm -hmm. And they say laughter is the, the best medicine. And I truly believe it because if we could have a clear and positive mental mind, I think that's more powerful like than any medication on the market. You know, I think our, we don't realize how strong and how powerful our brain really is. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, that's one of the things I notice whenever I go into a lot of um, like dementia wards or um, and my mom, she's worked years with uh, dementia patients um, mm -hmm. as a caregiver. And, you know, they can live to be a long, they can live a long time because they yeah. aren't stressed because they don't think about all of the things that would stress them out. Right. Um, they, they might think about it for a second, but then of course, all of a sudden their, their mind flips and they go right into something else. Yes. And so, um, and, but there's something to that. It's kind of like, I'm kind of the same way as a clown <laughs> now mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I'll start thinking about something, but then of course, you know, I don't know if it's ADHD kicking in or whatever. I'll also, <laughs> like, oh, <wait> <laughs> it's like, you know, I'll be like, Oh, my life is terrible. Oh, look at that ball. Hang on, hang on. You know, and all of a sudden I start doing something else. Um, and, and you learn to do that because, you know, when we go like uh, to uh, to another country and we're in an orphanage, you know, you might pull out a balloon and the kid is excited for like three seconds. And then all of a sudden they're looking at you like, what else you got clown, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you learn to quickly adapt. So I, I think that all comes from that. So yeah, I don't leave 
I don't leave my mind idle for too long on one little thing. So, right. uh, so that is helping my, <laughs> my mental <laughs> capacity. I, at least I hope so. I think that's good though, because some people, they overanalyze things. They, mm -hmm. they dwell on one specific thing and they can't get their mind off of it. And that could cause many, many problems mm -hmm. for the individual stress, anxiety, fear, anger, you know, a whole Absolutely. bunch of things, you know? So I think, I think that is a good strategy actually is to not dwell on one specific thing is to constantly keep your mind busy and focus on the things that make you happy, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, constantly keep your mind active. I think those are important strategies too. And I heard something from uh, an unlikely source. I don't know if you know who Amy Grant is, the singer. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was actually recently watching, you know, an interview with her and she said, you know, a lot of times we have so many things coming at us and people are, um, are wanting us to do so many things. And, you know, they said, how do you pick which events you go to or which things you do? And she says, you know, um, I water the seeds that mean the most to me. Oh, I like that. And I, and I just fell in love with that. It's like, and that's yes. kind of what I do. It's kind of, you know, there are a lot of people who want me to go to do the fun things. And then there are people who want me to go do the stuff at the nursing homes or the hospitals. And I'm tend to be drawn more toward the things that are more toward the hospitals and the humanitarian stuff yeah. and less away from the fun stuff because I still have fun doing the other things that I do. And those are the seeds for me that need the most water. I and like so that. that's kind of where I find myself drawn. So I just love that little phrase. So, sorry, Amy Grant, I'm stealing it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great, that's a great, great, great phrase because you think about that. That's important. You know, what are the seeds that mean the most to you, you know, and you, cause you can't be everywhere all at once. Do right. the things that are going to bring you happiness, that are going to bring you self-gratification and that will help others also, you know, I Absolutely. think that's important. That, that's a great phrase. I like that quote. I like that quote. Now, if you had to tell our audience a few things before you left, is there anything specific that you might want to like, you know, share with the audience that you might feel might be helpful? To me, uh, if I could say one thing, and if you'd only think of, um, one thing after this whole entire interview that I've said is um, the best thing you can do for yourself is to do nice things for other people. Yes. Because doing nice things for other people will bring you that self gratification that you need oh, when yeah. you need it. Um, like I said, and that's really, that's really what it came down to. You know, I, I was bullied for years and I had, I didn't feel that sense of worth. Yes. Um, and nothing can be better for your sense of worth than to walk into um, a memory care or an assisted living. And even if it's just, you know what, on Mother's Day, you buy a dozen flowers and you walk in and you hand everybody a flower and you walk out. I mean, just seeing the joy on somebody's face when you hand them a flower, you do something nice for somebody without expecting anything in return. Yes. So that I would be my, great. that'd be my one, my one thing. I think that's great. You know, there are times when I would be in the store, someone would look a little bit down and I would purposely just give them a compliment. You know, I don't even know who they are and their face would light up. And Absolutely. You, you know, and it was, it made me feel good. And I could tell it really had a positive impact on the other person. And people sometimes say to me, why are you always smiling? And well, you know what, when you do <laughs> things for other people and you, you are happy with who you are, you know, by the decisions you make in life, you, you tend to be happy and you tend to smile, you know, and I really, you have to really think about what makes you happy, what gives you self-gratification and don't be selfish about it. It's, it's very good to, ha you have to have self-love and take care of yourself, but it also is really good to give back what you get in life also. Exactly. And for, and for me, that is me, the, me giving back and me being, doing something nice for somebody else. Um, that is my self care, you know. Yeah. Um, I I don't need somebody to do the same for me. I don't need somebody to buy me a flower and give me a flower because it would right. probably die because I'm. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of flowers. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah. So that's that's what it is for me. That that's what keeps me going and uh, keeps me happy and humble. I guess. <laughs> oh, I think that's wonderful. I think that's wonderful. And before we go, just tell everybody your website one more time so they don't forget it. It's bullseye the clown.com or clownsonamission.com. 
Oh my God. Bullseye the Clown. It has been a pleasure meeting you today. Thank you for everything you do. And thank you for going out there and helping to change people's lives by putting a smile on their face and bringing happiness to their life. Because I think that's so valuable and so important because life, we tend to have so many people nowadays, especially going after each other's throats. We have a, you know, we have a society that's kind of lost track of what's important and not all, but in a lot of areas. And I, they need more people like you, more people to bring love, joy, happiness to others and to show other people how to be happy. So I think what you're doing is amazing. Thank you very much for everything. And thank you for taking the effort to come out and talk about your bullying and to help others by your own experience. That's very important. And thank you for that also. And thank you for having me on today. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. You have a great day. You too.